Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, from verse 28 through 34. That's where we'll be spending our time this morning. Our theme this morning, my dear friends, is titled, A Lesson on Loving God. A Lesson on Loving God. Now perhaps, when it comes to the subject of love, we all may have an opinion and uh, <laughs> the conversation can go in every direction am i not am i right do you agree yes no because i suppose some will have their own definition of love while many of us who hold to the biblical account would agree of a certain or specific definition of love but i want to take us 108 years ago 108 years ago, I don't know if you can recall what happened 108 years ago. I wasn't around, just by the way. <laughs> but 108 years ago, before the unsinkable ship, the Titanic, sunk on its first voyage, where over 1,500 passengers died, at the time of its departure, Pastor and preacher John Harper and his six-year-old daughter boarded the Titanic. I don't know if you're familiar with this story. Not really? Some? Yes? Well, let me share it with, with you as if you are hearing it for the first time. You see, they were traveling, John Harper and his, his daughter were traveling to Chicago where he would have the privilege of preaching at Moody Church. The church was anxiously awaiting their arrival because not only were, were their services pending, but he was coming to Lord willingly be their next pastor, as John Harper had anticipated accepting their invitation. So when the, when the Titanic struck the iceberg, Many of you might not know this, but Harper successfully led his daughter to a lifeboat. Being a widow, widower, Harper was allowed to join her, but he forsook his rescue, gave it up, choosing to provide for the masses one more chance to know Christ. I mean, he could have gotten on the ship, gone, safe. But he chose to provide with as many as possible the opportunity of knowing Christ. And so Harper, try and just envision this, Harper ran from person to person, passionately telling them about Christ. As the water began to fill the unsinkable ship, Harper was heard shouting, Women, children, and the unsaved into the lifeboats. See, being rejected by a certain man at the offer of salvation, Harper gave him his own life vest, saying, You need this more than I do. As the ship disappeared beneath the deep icy waters, leaving hundreds struggling with no realistic chance for rescue, Harper struggled through hypothermia to swim to as many people as he could, still sharing the gospel. Evidently, Harper would lose the, the battle to hypo, hypothermia. But not before giving as many as possible the chance of knowing the glorious Christ. Now four years after this tragic experience, some of the Titanic's survivors met um, in Canada. And one of the survivors recounted his meeting Harper. He says it was in the middle of the icy waters. He was testifying of how he was clinging to ship debris when Harper swam up to him. 
twice, challenging him with the biblical invitation to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He rejected the offer once, yet when he was given the second chance, with miles of water beneath his feet, he gave his life to Christ. Then, as, as Harper drowned into the watery grave, this new believer was rescued by a returning lifeboat. Amazing, isn't it? Up until that moment, his last moment, Harper pleaded with the people to give their lives to Christ. Harper's action, my dear friends, shows us what a deep and true love for God is. A love so real, a love that was poured out into loving the very image of God. Many who would shy away from those icy waters, having the opportunity to get in a lifeboat, would. But Harper, in a sense, understood the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God. And he did. He did, but Christ, when Christ gave us a second command, to love your neighbor as yourself, Harper knew that he would not be loving himself or anyone else if he weren't giving them the gospel. If he weren't giving them the opportunity to know and behold Christ. This example comes to our theme this morning. As we're going to learn more about being faithful in loving our Lord. This morning I want to challenge us. As we look at our love for God and our love for His image bearers. That you be mindful of this. There is a qualification for loving God. But there is also the instruction on how. We ought to love God. But before we jump into those, I want us just to read together, pray together, and consider the context of our passage. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12, from verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, What commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all understanding, and with all strength, and to love one's own neighbor as oneself, is much more than all the burnt offering and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw... That he answered wisely he said to him you are not far from the kingdom of god and after this no one dared to ask jesus any more questions let's pray together our lord as we consider the, this word this morning help us to grasp these truths lord give us the grace to apply them effectively but also help us just to trust that it's you who enables us to love, to know what love is, to be capable of loving another. And so this morning I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds. In your name, Amen. So we come to the context. Friends, you have to understand what's happening in our portion in Mark before we can get to the teaching aspect of our lesson. Verse 28 says, One of the scribes came. This is an indication that this is the third wave of questioning that Jesus was going to encounter. Do you recall the previous two encounters? 
Yes? No? The first encounter was when the Pharisees came to Christ, asking about their taxes. The second encounter was the Sadducees coming to Jesus and asking about the resurrection. In both cases, they wanted to trap Jesus. In our third case this morning, the scribe was sent by the Sanhedrin to trap Jesus. But we get the sense that there was something genuine to the question he was asking. He wasn't just asking for the sake of trapping Jesus, but he was asking out of a sense to be sure. We'll look at it in a moment. Matthew 22 verse 34 actually tells us that the scribe was sent by the Sanhedrin. It says, they gathered together. Who? The Pharisees, the scribes, perhaps even the Sadducees, perhaps even the Herodians. To come up with another way to try and trick Jesus. And so this, the first two attempts were unsuccessful. I don't know where the hope came that a third attempt might kind of just spike a change. Maybe they did, because let me tell you this. If you know anything about the scribes, it is this. The scribes were legal experts. You couldn't tell them anything about the law. They studied the law. This was their job. This was their daily routine. So when the scribe was sent to Jesus, we get the sense that certainly he is not alone, but he serves as the spokesman. What we also read in our passage is, he heard the previous arguments. So he was among the group. He heard the argument about the resurrection. Perhaps even the argument about taxes. Remember, friends, this is Wednesday of Passion Week. All these things took place one after the other. Being stunned by the answers that Jesus gave, I believe the scribe recognized something in Christ. So he comes with another question. What is the, the commandment foremost of all what is the greatest commandment yes the question is posed to trap Christ but as I said there's a sense that the scribe wanted to be sure for himself and the answer is simple the answer is very simple however the Pharisees felt that the gospel Jesus was preaching was a contradiction to the law And their hope is that Christ, in answering this question, would give them something more than what Moses has given us. Something more than what they know in the Old Testament law to be true. Because that's where they can trap him. Oh, now you're adding. You see, that is blasphemy. Yet Christ takes them to a, a word that they elevated so highly to a person they elevated so highly. Moses. Why was Moses so elevated? If you know your Old Testament, you would know that Moses had some fairly unique experiences with God, isn't it? I mean, come on. Go up a mountain and personally encounter with God and live to tell the story? To behold a burning bush speaking to you, yet the bush isn't consumed within the fire. There was a sense that, that Moses was close to God. No one was any nearer. Therefore, the reflection of the word of God would be purer and truer if it came from Moses. This would have an impact, isn't it? If Jesus was to reject the word of, of Moses as the law, 
then they can reject Him as the Messiah. They would have a reason to sell the idea to Rome that Christ is a rebel and that He is a threat to the Roman Empire. And that Caesar would have to execute Jesus Christ. Friends, that is the plan. It certainly wasn't the plan in the beginning of the week. But as Jesus is putting them in their place, their hatred for Him is growing. Come Friday, we'll see just how that hatred led them to nailing Christ on a cross. So Jesus answers them. Look at verse 29. Jesus responds to the scribe with what is perhaps a simple and stunning answer. He, he, he replies by quoting how we know the word this, today is Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 and 5. The Shema. Jesus says that the most important commandment is to love God completely. That every part of our being is to be devoted to God. Jesus says that all my strength, my energy, it has to be God's. It must belong to Him. Loving God, my friends, listen, loving God is both the beginning and the end of our relationship with God. Further, when Jesus answers him in this way, he implies that there is a, an obedience to all of God's commands. Because if you love God, you're going to obey what He says. I think the question was posed wrong. I believe the question that He should be asking, the question we this morning should be asking is, how can I be made right with God since I do not completely love Him? That's the question. How can I be made, with, made right with God since I do not completely love Him? Not what is the greatest commandment. However, that is where our story goes this morning. I pose this question because we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves about our love for God because friends admitted there might be times that you would want to love the God of your imagination instead of the God who is. Many of us fall in the trap of not loving the God who has revealed Himself in the Scriptures. We love the God who is a figment of our imagination. And I say that with a small g. And just like the scribe in our story, Jesus says, You are near. You are near to the kingdom. You are close. But still so far away. You are still so far away. And many of us, Perhaps here today, many who tune into this might be far away from God. And I, I can explain why. You want to know why? Many are not in the kingdom of God because they worship a false God. They worship a God of indulgences, of our worldly pleasures rather than the God who stands against it. Folks want to worship a God who is impressed with arrogance and pride. A God who appreciates our anatomy rather than a God who calls us to submit to the authority that's been put over us. A God who is pleased with us being entertained by sin rather than a God who expects us to set nothing wicked before our eyes. A God who has no rules, rather a God who has revealed His righteous rules for our good and for our glory. No. Many folks today, sure, I love God. The God who allows me to live in my sin. The God who allows me to get so drunk out of my mind because it brings pleasure. That's, yeah. 
My dear friends, God is to be loved completely, totally. That's what we see in verse 30. Because God alone, God alone is the covenant keeper of his love for his people. And so in order to love God, something has to happen. Something has to change that makes it possible for us to love the God who has revealed himself in the scriptures. Would you agree with me? Can we spontaneously just love God? No, Paul says, no one seeks after God. No one. Something has to happen. And that brings us to point number two after looking at the context. And really, this is where our teaching lies this morning. The qualification for loving God. There has to be a qualification for loving God. Look at verse 30. Just let's read it together. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Friends, this is important. Because many may say, I love God. When you grew up in a Christian home, you grow up around people who say they love God. And so you assume the same. Perhaps even in our ethnic groups, we grow up in a community where people say they love God. And so you assume the same. There's a grave danger in these false misconceptions. You can't just say, I love God and assume that you do. You have to be made aware. You have to be made new in His very love in order to experience His love so that you can love. The reality is this, you may claim or say that you love God, but if you have not been qualified to love God, then it's just an ideology. It's just a belief. Let's say you're on the brink of bankruptcy and now you just shout to a group, I declare bankruptcy. Does that make it official? No. Something has to happen. There has to be a qualification. This is what Christ makes us aware of. 1 John 4 verse 19 says, We love because who? He first loved us. He first loves us. If there is no conversion to Christ, there is no love for God. Ezekiel 36 says, 26 says that we need a new heart. A new heart, a new spirit. And the heart of stone has to be removed. Now we're on the track to being qualified in loving God. You see, if this doesn't take place, the heart of stone cannot know the love of God. And just like the scribe assumes his love for God, many others do. They don't take the time to examine the reality of truly being in Christ, of truly knowing Christ. Therefore, in answering him, Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. And rightly so. The implication is this, and I think this should be screaming in his ears. However, you are not in the kingdom. Get it? Hey, scribe, you are not far from the kingdom. Red lights, warning siren, hello, this means you are not in the kingdom. 
If you were on the Titanic sinking, you are perishing. You need more than a lifeboat. You need Christ. You need to embrace Christ because when you embrace Christ, Romans 5 verse 5 says, His love is poured into your heart. That is what enables you to love God. That is the qualification. If you want to fulfill these commandments, we see Christ revealed before us. You have to qualify. You have to be enabled. And the only possible way to, to do this is when Christ first loves us. And Romans 5 verse 6 says, Christ died for us while we were still weak. While we were still enemies, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ does that so that through faith, we can enter into His obedience. And once we experience this, once we enter His obedience, once we trust Christ for salvation, there's a spiritual surgery that takes place. Where the heart of stone is removed. And you are now given the ability to not only love God. To not only experience the love of God. But to share God's love. Do you follow? Are you with me? And so once we now have been saved. Once we have been enabled to love Him. We're not close to the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. You can be close, but so close and yet so far away. You want to be in the kingdom. Now, once we've established this, once you have been qualified to love God, once you have repented from your sins, embraced Christ, rely on Christ, there is an instruction for us on how we need to love God. And that's our final point this morning. The instruction on loving God. This is what Christ tells the scribe. He says, verse 30, that you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, in addition to love your neighbor as yourself. You want to love God? You need to love Him His way. And that includes loving your neighbor. Now let's expand on this. If you've read this before, if you've spent some time meditating on this before, you might notice that these two commands are a summary of the Ten Commandments. The first... Let me show you. The first four are summarized by loving God. Because there should be a sense of, of love that's connected to fearing God. Let me just, let's go into this. The first four commandments. To love the Lord means that there will be no other gods before Him. Meaning there won't be one thing or another that we acknowledge above God. No, we love the Lord, our God alone. The second, which addresses idols. It says we won't have any idols, meaning we won't add an addition that shares the love and commitment that is meant for God alone. Thirdly, you won't misuse or abuse the name of the Lord your God. Why? Because you're not going to disregard the purity and holiness that is connected to His name because His name reveals His character. Do you follow? See, but it's okay to, to watch movies that use the Lord's name. It's a, that profanity... Is disregarding the purity and the holiness of God's name. Number four. The fourth commandment addresses our regard for His word. To remember and to keep the Sabbath. Why? 
God has created us to rest so that we can honor Him by, by just setting a specific time aside to be in His presence to worship. The Sabbath was never meant to do nothing. And if you believe that, my friends, I'm sorry, you've, you've missed the understanding. The Sabbath was created for man to take a step back and to reflect on God, to worship God. Six days you will work and you will labor, you will be miff, man. But there must be a time to know God. As the psalmist says, be still and know God. That's its purpose. And so just looking at the first four commandments given and, and, and summarized by our love for God, the most supreme duty of man, therefore, is to love God for who God is and what He has done. That's it. To love God for who He is. That's why Jesus says to love Him with your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. Jesus shows us here that loving God is a way of being. It's not a list of things you have to do. You don't get up, stick a checklist on the mirror and say, this is how I've loved God this morning. Loving God is a way of life. So, we need to love God in the everyday moments of life, not just when we feel like worshipping Him. Why does Jesus add this? Why does Jesus say to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind and strength? You'll remember in our call to worship this morning, we addressed what is the heart in reference to. And the, the heart is, is a reference to our core being. If we love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind and strength, we love Him purely. We love Him with a commitment. You see, when we don't do this, what the heart is full of, our actions will reveal. So when the alcoholic turns to the bottle, she might be saying, I trust this to satisfy and fulfill me. I trust that this will save my soul. When the dad has his hopes tuned to the success or happiness of his children, he is saying that my family is what I trust to satisfy and fulfill me. This is what I trust to save my soul. Christ says when you love God with your whole heart, soul, mind and strength, you are trusting God to satisfy you. Therefore Jesus says, or starts with this great commandment saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This was sort of like a pledge of allegiance to God. Say, this is what I stand for. This is who I stand for. I pledge my allegiance to loving God with my entire being. And when you do that, your love for God is acceptable. When it flows from your heart, believing the gospel, when your, when your mind takes the thoughts of God captives, captive, when, when, when with, with your strength you act in every way to glorify God, you are loving Him. You are loving Him. That's why I say, friends, it's not a list of do's. It's a way of life. It should be so engraved in, in our hearts that it's by force of habit that we act in these ways so that we would glorify God, so that we would love God. But there's an addition here. Verse 31, 
Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself. Now the commandment to love God with everything in us is inseparably, listen, inseparably connected to the command to love others. John warns us of this very thing. You can't say you love God and not your brother. Because then you don't love God. And hear this, the love of God is not in you. That means you're not qualified. Not saved. So Jesus brings this to our attention. Why? Because this one command summarizes the next six ten com- of, the, of the Ten Commandments. When you love your neighbor as yourself, guess what? You will respect your parents. You will have respect for authority. You will have respect for life. You won't kill anyone. You will have a respect for moral purity and not commit adultery. A respect for others' goods and rights and you won't steal what belongs to them. You will have a respect for what is true and won't lie. Do you follow? If anyone says to you they can summarize the Ten Commandments with three, do them one better and summarize it in two. Show them that the love for God is one that needs to be qualified. See, when we when we love the Lord, we respect God for, for what He has provided for us and we would be content and not covered. It means to regard God's creation highly. Why? Hear me out. And I, I get so frustrated. Man was created in the image of God. Did you hear me? Genesis 1, 26, 27. In His image, in His likeness, we were all created. Each and every one of us. So when we sin against one another, we sin against the God who created that person. We're defiling His image. And being image bearers and knowing we are His image bearers calls us to look at people differently. To look at people with grace. Especially those who have a distorted image. Right? Because that's where we are. When we're not in Christ, the image of God has been distorted. It's like when you get out the shower and the mirror is completely... Uh, just steam can't see a thing you can't see the reflection that is what someone looks like who isn't in Christ they can't see clearly they don't know the truth truly therefore we look at them with grace I want you to hear me out even in this season of, of, of far murders of gender based violence of abortion and everything else committed to man we might fall in the trap to be tempted at looking at one another with hate and disregard do you follow the temptation is there and it's being fed to us by everyone around us Sides are being created. You're on this side or on that side. I am on the side of God's image and want justice for all of God's image. Friends, and this might be the hard part. I'm not asking for your forgiveness because I'm not about to sin against you, but I'm asking that you would forgive in your own hearts if what I say next offends you because then I believe it's the Holy Spirit ministering to you. By loving your neighbor means as a woman to not prejudge all men as abusers. 
but as image bearers. Someone created in God's image. To love your neighbor means to look at the unborn as image bearers who have been given life, but who haven't experienced that life on earth yet. It means as a farmer to not look at a black man as a terrorist. And as a black man to not look at a farmer as a racist or an enemy. Do you hear me? For we are first and foremost created in the image of God. Not your own opinion. Not the circumstances outside of you. The circumstances that have affected you. We are created in the image of God and therefore we need to be image bearers of God who love God with our entire being, meaning we will love our neighbor as ourselves. And for this reason, we need to actively kill the preconceived ideas that limit our approach and care to those around us. For we are to love God and His creation. And that must determine how we respond. Truly in application, that's the lesson here. That's the lesson here. Imagu Deu, created in His image. And I want you to hear me. This is the grace. There are people killing our farmers. Please. Disregard the politicians, whoever deny that reality, because it is a reality and it's very, very close to home. Not only are they murdering our farmers, but their workers as well. There are men who are abusing women and children. There are parents who murder their babies. And sadly, sadly, there is a majority of concern of, or of certain ethnicity that are tied to these crimes. It's unfortunate. Did you get that? Unfortunately, there is a majority of certain ethnicity connected to these crimes. And so if we have preconceived ideas, it's only going to generate the fires. We're going to pour more fuel on it. Friends, hear me out. We commit a gross sin when we generalize the actions of people and tie it to a certain class. James 4 verse 11 and 12 says, Do not speak evil against the, uh, one, one another. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law... You are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor? This is God's word. So let me conclude. Jesus says we are to love the Lord our God with our entire being. To love his image bearers as we love ourselves. These are the most important commandments. Again, as they summarize the Ten Commandments. In order to do this, let me recap. You have to be enabled. You have to qualify through Christ. To be able to love God. Experience God's love. So that you can love those around you. My friends, as a pastor, I also want to share this. If you have experienced a tragedy, someone from a different ethnicity, someone from a different gender, I want to plead with you. If you are hurting, if you are hating, then we're no better than those who committed these crimes against us. We have a, we have a Savior who has taken the burden of our sin. Who has given us forgiveness freely. I'm more than willing to journey with you through this difficult road that just seems as if there might not be a light. 
but there has to be a sense of reconciliation, a sense of restoration. That's why I want to challenge you. Come to Christ for forgiveness and for restoration. Remember our story in the beginning of the message? John Harper. John Harper wasn't concerned with his possessions. He made sure his daughter was safe. That was his responsibility. As a father, he had to take care of his daughter. And he did that. And having done so, knowing that she's on her way to Chicago, the church will minister to her, perhaps even go back home, the next responsibility he had was to love God and his neighbor as himself. And knowing that he was saved, leaving the unsaved means he wouldn't be loving himself. He wouldn't be loving the image of God. And he committed to trying to share to many people as possible to the point of his death. May that be an example for us, not a challenge an example for us to look up to to love god with all that we have and to obey him in loving our neighbor as ourselves. amen let me pray for us and then we'll sing together Lord jesus we want to just give thanks for this word we know these truths have pierced our hearts perhaps ignited just our thinking patterns and our thought life Therefore, Christ, I want to pray for your grace. I want to pray for your perfect peace. I want to pray for our members this morning, Lord. For many of us who have been directly touched through tragedy, that, that sadly we've just tied to ethnicity or to a gender or to a group. I pray, Lord, that let us be aware we live in a fallen world, in a sinful world. And so let us know it's the love of Christ that compels us. Therefore, let us act and respond in obedience. Lord, that when we are angry, help us to not sin in our anger, but to rely on you, to trust that you will vindicate. You are the just judge. And the day will come, Lord Jesus, when you bring the sword. But until then, help us. Help us to love the enemy.